thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. I'm going to probably go pretty quickly through slides. There are a fair amount of details with these. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly so we have some time for questions, because I think everybody likes to ask questions. Some of the pictures are a little graphic. So if you're at all squeamish, I'm just giving you a, a heads up. All right. So this is an old cartoon. And for those in the back that can't see it, and if I'm not speaking loudly enough, interrupt me. Um, this is a casual talk. I want everybody to be able to hear uh, well. But it says, the intern who worked on me was an art major before going to med school. <laughs> and that, that is close to home for me because I was an art major at Cornell. <laughs> I was also pre-med, so because a lot of times I tell my patients that and they're like, no, no, I did study medicine also. <laughs> so there are lots of photographs in this slideshow. I'm going to go fairly quickly through things. This is a child. It's a larger brown spot. If this was a new spot in an adult, of course you'd be concerned about it because it's a weird shape. But this is a birthmark, evenly colored. The shape is not that normal. Um, but as long as that's not changing, it's OK to monitor that. OK, again, just showing a birthmark. Uh, people show me different spots all the time. And it's very difficult for people to assess spots on themselves and determine whether it's a problem, whether it's a concern. Fortunately, a lot of the spots that people are worried about are OK. So another birthmark. Birthmarks can be the size of a dime. They can, be, they can take up a whole chest, face, body. So they can be quite large. Another example of a pretty normal spot. This has hair in it. Hair is normal. It's sort of an oval shape. Not all moles are perfectly round. Um, but the edges of this are fairly smooth, and the color is fairly even. So I'm trying to show pictures of things that look more normal. This looks a little more concerning because it's darker. I know it's a little shaded. But still, even though it's dark, it's evenly colored. So this is OK. This varies from that first one we saw on the child's neck in that it has variation in shape. I would argue that that is notched or jagged there. It has darker areas and then some areas that are pink and tan. So this is asymmetrical. The border is irregular. The color is irregular. The diameter is bigger than a pencil eraser. And this was changing on this man's face. So this is an example of melanoma, which is the most dangerous cancer. This is what can happen if melanoma is unattended to and spreads. Our society is obsessed with tan skin. So skin cancer. It's the most common of any cancer. It's increasing at a rate faster than any other type of cancer. This is a great example of the most common type of skin cancer. This gentleman has a basal cell carcinoma, or what we call basal cell cancer, right there. And it looks like a scar. And it's sort of a shiny, pearly spot. I tell my patients all the time, if you have a spot that looks like a pimple that won't heal, that's something that you need to take note of. Because a lot of times, it will, it will it'll heal but then it'll scab in the same area. And if that's there for more than a few months, you've got to get it worked on. This person had a, a Mohs procedure, which is a special type of cancer surgery to remove it. And he did fine. So basal cell carcinoma. One out of five fair-skinned people gets this in their lifetime. I tell patients, and it can be very difficult for people. It can be destructive. It's very rare that it is deadly. Uh, 
if, if I could choose what kind of cancer I was, would get, I would choose this over a lot of other kinds of cancers. So I'm not trying to <coughs> diminish the importance of this cancer because it's very common. But if <coughs> caught early and if in not a sensitive location, you know, it's, it's more difficult if it's close to your eye on your eyelid or on the tip of your nose or on your lip. But if it's in a less sensitive location, um, you end up with a scar. So scars are always better than cancer. Sun exposed skin, less than 200 reports of metastasis. The word metastasis means to spread to a, di a different or separate location. And that's what makes cancer dangerous is when it spreads elsewhere in our bodies. So more information about basal cell carcinoma. It's shiny, pearly looking. It's, it can either be a bump, that's what a papule is, a nodule is a hard bump, or a plaque is sort of a slightly raised firm area. It oftentimes will have a central ulcer. That means a little sore spot that won't heal. Or telangiectasia, so it can be a shiny pink spot with little blood vessels. That's what telangiectasia means. You can see all the sun damage this person's had, very freckled. That's a great example of a basal cell cancer. It's dented in the middle. It's sort of shiny, pink, pearly. Another example of a basal cell cancer, you can, that, that's a blood vessel, a telangiectasia. Young person, this is more of a patch that was not healing, treated for a long time as psoriasis but this is more of a superficial basal cell cancer, fairly extensive. Like I said, we won't linger on pictures too long here. So skin cancer, over one million new cases of non-melanoma skin cancer. So mel not all skin cancer is melanoma. A lot of times I'll see patients that are new to me, oh yeah, I had a couple melanomas removed. And then I really have to quiz them, are you sure it was a melanoma? So the most common cancer is the basal cell cancer. Melanoma is the cancerous mole. So one in every five Americans will have a skin cancer. Another example, doesn't look like much, but this is a shiny area. Ends up being pretty big. So obviously, I'm showing ones that have more impact. Do we remove these big ones every day? No. Most of them are small ones that take me five minutes to remove. All of these are basal cell. Instead of being more shiny and pink, these have some pigment to them. So basal cell cancer can sometimes have brown color to it. This is more of a surface one like that young woman's forehead. So it's more of a pink patch. But it would scab, it'd get scaly. This is showing one. Now that looks concerning for melanoma because it's so dark. It's almost a slate gray. But this is a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. We would do a deeper biopsy on that to make sure of what it is. Again, pink, shiny, patch, scabbing in the middle, not healing. Squamous cell carcinoma. Second most common type of skin cancer. Um, can spread to distant sites. Can metastasize. When caught early, it's usually a small pink uh, warty type bump on the hand or face. When caught early, we remove it and people do fine. Second most common skin cancer. Face, back of the hands. It's a non-healing, usually a pink bump. So that's a pretty big range. Most of them that I see we're catching early. Very low risk of spreading. If the horse gets out of the barn, like with any cancer, then it's more difficult to treat. So it can spread to lymph nodes and elsewhere. So this looks a lot like basal cell to my eye, um, but the biopsy proved it to be a squamous cell cancer. Somebody's ear, I mean, back of the hand, very common to see it on the back of the hand. And usually they're tender, they grow a little faster than basal cell cancer. It's sort of a, people will say, I thought I had a little cyst or boil, but it wouldn't, wouldn't break for me. Behind the ear, back of the hand. 
So you're starting to see the pattern with these face in front of the ear. 70% of skin cancer occurs on the head and neck, because that's where we get a lot of sun. Squamous cell cancer has a thin or surface variant of it, just like basal cell cancer. So this is somebody's chest. It's a pink patch that wouldn't heal. So that's called in situ, and it just means it's a surface skin cancer. Got to have some cartoons. So if you can't read it, it's still dark, Marmaduke. Let's wait until dawn cracks. That's uh, me and my dog last night with a thunderstorm. <laughs> All right, consider biopsy. If you have a spot that just isn't healing, you need to show it to your family doctor. They can do a biopsy. If they're concerned about it, they'll call us or another dermatologist or plastic surgeon. Um, dermatologists do skin cancer. Head and neck surgeons, the ear, nose, and throat doctors do skin cancer. Plastic surgeons do skin cancer. Family doctors, when it's not on the face, some of them will do it on the face, but some of them will do some of the biopsies. I mean, it's such a common cancer, we need everybody's help with this. If it's sort of pearly or shiny, if it's not healing. I sometimes will have people that are, that are nervous about spots because they've had other cancer spots, and you know, they'll call and the, I've got a sore, it's been here for a week. You know, it's, you know, you gotta do the regular stuff, put antibiotic ointment on it, see if it heals. But if it's been there, when in doubt, cut it out. Gotta biopsy it. <laughs> Cancer usually does not hurt. So besides scabbing or crusting, most people say, oh, nope, that doesn't bother me. Even those big ones that we saw on the ear. Obviously, if people have had skin cancer, we're more inclined to be more aggressive with new spots popping up on them. So different ways to treat it. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. Curatage, French word for scraping. Electrosurgery, electric surgery, we can burn things. We can cut them out, surgical excision. That means cutting around it. You can do radiation. Um, radiation, if we have larger skin cancers, a lot of times you'll cut it out first and then do radiation. Uh, with basal cell cancers, I will see some patients that are just not good candidates for surgery. And we will work with the radiation doctors, and they can make them go away. Um, radiation has a risk of cancer farther down the road, but if you're a 90-year-old person and you have this big thing on your cheek that's bleeding and scabbing, um, you'd rather do the radiation than a big surgery. Cryosurgery, not a routine thing for skin cancer, but that is freezing. We freeze sun damage spots and precancers all the time. Mohs is a word you may have heard of before. It is named after Dr. Mohs, uh, and he was a dermatologist from Wisconsin who invented this or developed this technique for removing skin cancer. And he originally designed this for basal cell cancer. And it now is used for basal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer, and even some types of melanoma. So that has one of the higher cure rates. We will do that type of surgery if the other ways don't get rid of it, if it comes back, or if it's in a real cosmetically sensitive area. Um, it's, it has a high cure rate, over 90%. I've seen articles that'll say 97 to 99%. Um, but uh, not perfect, but very good. So successful treatment, selection, selection, selection. It's sort of like a real estate location, location, location. So <laughs> selection of treatment. I mean, you don't treat everything the same way. You have to decide on what type of cancer it is, where is it located, what's the cost going to be. What I do most commonly is if it's a small enough lesion, I do what's called a shave biopsy. So I will remove the majority of it um, try to remove all of it that I can with that biopsy, and then we scrape it. And that has over a 90% cure rate, and it's more cost-effective than any of the other treatments. And your familiarity with it. Uh, doctor, I worked with Dr. Johnson for the last decade, and he was a well-known dermatologist here for 30 years. Uh, I see a lot of his patients and my patients that just, they, they know the routine and what we're going to do. All right. This is an old cartoon that is applicable every time I show it. 
So it says, this is your new physician. Due to cutbacks in your health coverage, I'll no longer be handling your case. And so it's showing a medicine doctor from the jungle. <laughs> Skin cancer. Melanoma, cancerous mole, that's the most dangerous thing. Non-melanoma cancer. Majority is non-melanoma cancer, which is good. Deaths from skin cancer, 75% are melanoma. Only 25% are non-melanoma. The majority of those, the great majority, are squamous cell cancer. There are a few types I'm not covering today that are rarer types of skin cancer that can also spread elsewhere. So I already talked about this. This is probably the biggest take-home slide of the, the night because this is what can save your life. So the A, B, C, Ds of melanoma. Asymmetry. One side doesn't look like the other. We're talking about a brown mole. Border irregularity. Notched or jagged around the edges, not a smooth edge. More than one color in a mole and bigger than a pencil eraser. Now, I bet everybody in this room has a mole that's bigger than a pencil eraser. It does not mean you have melanoma. You have to typically have two or three of these features to make us more concerned. They have added in the last few years E to this list, and E stands for evolving or changing. And I think that's probably one of the most important hallmarks of, of a melanoma is, hey, doctor, I've had this brown spot on my arm for three years, but now it's got this little pink area next to it. That's what you want to notice with things if it's changing. All right, I know I'm talking faster and faster here. We could stop this if you want to open it up to questions, or I can keep going through slides. Does anybody have a question at this point? Yes? Um, you showed the little slide about tanning. Yes. Um, what about tanning booths? Yes, that's a, that's a great point, and I can talk for a long time about it. Um, not healthy, not, not safe. Uh, what about tanning booths? And there are studies that show, which is sort of scary to me, that even being in a tanning booth one time increases your risk of skin cancer. And, and I see young kids all the time, you know, oh, don't worry, she only tans before prom or before homecoming. So it's something that we really need to teach our children that it's just not safe. And it's sort of like sunburns. We've all had sunburns. We try to avoid them. Some of us are quicker learners than others that sunburns hurt and they're no fun. Um, but some people just get burned over and over, and it's sort of like the more blistering burns you have, the more increased risk of cancer. Just recently, tanning booths were moved to the level one uh, rating of radiation danger by, like, the World Health Organization. There are some countries that are trying to ban it. I think it's something we need to try to do in the United States. We've been trying but there's big industry and big money in tanning beds. So spray-on tans are safe as far as we know. Um, but yeah, try, don't, don't let the young people tan because they get addicted to it. Melanoma. So this is a bigger patch on somebody's cheek. Not really notched or jagged, but it's tan, brown, and pink. So this is a very early melanoma. Melanoma. You, everybody would notice that spot. Okay, we're going to play a little game. <laughs> oh, okay. Molar melanoma. I mean, audience participation, that's what's fun about yeah, this, right? Yeah. Okay, so just out loud, is this a molar melanoma? Mole. That's a Cindy Crawford mole. <laughs> molar melanoma. melanoma. Yeah, that, that just doesn't look good. How about that? Melanoma. I agree. How about that? Mole. mole. And some people uh, in talks I've given before will say, what about basal cell cancer? It's sort of pink and shiny, and that's where history is important. I mean, this, this guy would say, oh, yeah, I've had these since I was a kid. I have to be careful with shaving. This is just a normal pink raised mole, totally fine. It's actually a normal mole. It's a, diff it's a tough picture. I'm not giving you any reference. I mean, it looks like it's huge. So it's a magnified picture. You can, the surface is a little bumpy, but the shape is nice and round. The overall color is fine. You bet. You guys are good. Anybody free? 
Come to help me. Mole, raise mole. It looks like one. It's actually a little bit of chocolate frosting on the edge of that donut. <laughs> All right, I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly. Um, mole cells. Um, another name for mole is nevus. Mole cells tend to group or cluster in what we call nests. And this is what they normally do. And this is showing top layer of skin, or epidermis, the deeper layer, dermis, and then subcutaneous, meaning under the skin, which is the fat. Mole cells typically are in this area. When a mole becomes cancerous, the whole, the most important thing is detecting it early when those mole cells are still in these high layers of skin. Some, I've seen melanomas, you know, silver dollar size that have sat on somebody's arm for years and they do fine. You remove it and they're fine because it, it, the melanoma never was in an aggressive, invasive phase. It grew on the surface. So when it starts growing deep is when it has more risk to spread elsewhere. And unfortunately, there are some types of melanoma that at presentation, when I see them and they say, Doc, this is a new spot. It just came up three months ago. It's already deep. It doesn't happen a lot. Most melanomas give us a little bit of time, but some of them can go deep fast. There was a doctor that, this, that came up with measuring how deep it was, and so it's named after Breslow. If it is, this is, this is in millimeters. So we want to detect a melanoma before it is, we want to detect it when it's not invasive at all, but one millimeter or thinner has a very high cure rate. So another important take home message is that not all melanoma kills people. I mean, I have lots and lots of patients that have had melanoma that are leading productive, healthy lives. We want to detect things early. So the, I'd say probably the majority of my patients have thin melanoma. So this is in millimeters. We want them thin. So when they have a thin melanoma, you don't really have to do a whole bunch of stuff. You just cut it out. So in situ means it has not invaded at all. I'm removing one next week on somebody, so I take a half centimeter margin about around it. If usually for each millimeter deep, we go about a centimeter around it. When they get really big, I mean, you can imagine if this is somebody's cheek, three centimeters, I mean, you're getting to be a big area. That's a lot of times when we need help from the general surgeon or plastic surgeon, reconstructive surgeons. Sunscreen, 15 or greater, I always tell people 25 or higher. You know, sometimes you cannot avoid being in the sun. Uh, baseball games tend to be at noon. They don't have many trees on the infield or outfield. You got to wear your hats. If you're at games watching children, grandchildren, just try to cover up, wear hats. Teach the kids early. I think kids today are much better about protecting from the sun than I was and then uh, past generations. Sunscreen, got to use it. H cover up with hats. <laughs> Tanning was not always an obsession with our society. There was a time when people preferred to be fair skin. And I won't go into all of the changes, but you know, that's what we like to do now as a society. Go to the beach, get in the water. Yeah. So that's the end. <laughs> yes? Being a fair skinned person and a child, it kind of surprised me on the 25 steps. So if we buy 54 grandchildren, are we getting. Are we getting. That, yeah, very good question about sun protection and um, about what strength of sunscreen. And I said I tell my patients at least a 25 or higher. Uh, SPF, sun protection factor, is specific to blocking ultraviolet B. And there's recently been stuff in the media about ultraviolet A 
and that the sunscreens available to us don't block all of ultraviolet A. And that's correct, but most of the sunscreens now will say broad spectrum UVA, UVB, and they do a really good job with UVB. They do some of UVA. Both of them cause cancer. Um, it used to be a 15 or higher. I still think that's probably a pretty good rule, but 25 to 30 or higher, there are some that are 100. You get to the point of diminishing returns. So a 25 or higher is like a 90, 94% blocking. You're going to sweat it off. You're going to wash it off. You've got to reapply. Yeah, good question. I, about every hour and a half to two hours. Um, the example I tell people, of, if we're in Cedar Rapids, we're driving to Chicago, we put our seat belts on, we take off, when we hit the Quad Cities, we don't snap our seat belts off for the rest of the trip. But if you put your sunscreen on first thing in the morning and don't reapply, you're not protected. If you're outside for five hours, you're going to probably get burned. So you've got to reapply. Yes? I'm on medication. It makes you really sensitive, you know, for RA and whatever. Sure. more? That's a good question. If it, it varies from person to person in what your skin type is. There are some people that, I mean, are outside for 10 minutes and they start to get pink. Um, and if you're one of those people, you, you probably, what's even better than sunscreen is sun protection, long sleeves, hats, just trying to avoid those peak sun hours. But to specifically answer your question, I guess it would depend on when you notice that you start to get a little red. So if, if your sunscreen if you can be out for two hours and you're not getting burned at all, then you're fine. But if you notice after about an hour, and it's different from, for different days. So there could be, you know, sometimes the days you get burned are those cool spring days when we don't think the sun's that intense and we're out raking the yard and then you get burned. That, that happens a lot. Or cloudy days where you're out for a long time, you can get burned. Good questions. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, with a lot of things, you get what you pay for. Um, but I don't think you necessarily have to have a $40 sunscreen. I mean, I, I use several different brands personally with my own kids. I'll use the Target brand. I'll use the Neutrogena brand. I'll use the Coppertone brand. I do like to check the dates on them because if it's sunscreen from last year, it can expire and then it might not work as well. So I think that's one thing you want to make sure you have fresh. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with what you like. Most guys don't like putting creams on their skin, especially if they have hairy arms. Um, so I use sport gels for, for those guys, um, or the sprays are really good for covering bigger areas. Um, so there's not, you know, I would think the brands probably try to argue that theirs is better than this one. I do think some of them have some technology that's beneficial. Neutrogena has a chemical in theirs that helps stabilize their sunscreen that they've patented. Uh, L'Oreal has a chemical that helps block the UVA, which is harder to get in the United States. So there are a couple that have some benefit, but I think if you're doing, picking up, you know, something at Target or Walmart, uh, you know, sort of pick the one that uh, is economical uh, and, it, and it has the properties that you want with it. Okay. Other questions? Do we need to keep moving? Probably need to keep moving okay. to upstairs. So thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank you.